I'm very grateful to Bob and Hernan for pointing out the following bug. Is it working now? Uh, the following bug. It should be zero here. Right? Euclid has zero. He says, start with one, then at two, then at four. And every time, if the sum is prime, multiply it by the last number you got, and you will get a perfect number. All right? So I, I missed it badly. Apologies. Well, I assume that this sum starts with 1, because this is 1. This is not so, of course. Uh, and I couldn't fix it now, because it's all done in LaTeX, and I have to go back to my office. But OK, so uh, the end, we will start from the end of Fermat's life, since uh, it sort of appears in this time. Uh, at some point, uh, Fermat bought a Boucher edition of Diophantus. Boucher was a French mathematician who came, of whom we're going to meet, but not today, uh, who published a uh, Latin translation with commentaries of uh, a Greek number theory book by Diophantus. And uh, then Fermat dies. And his son, who was a very dutiful son, said that I'm going to go through my father's books. And he discovered that there were very many uh, notes on this copy of Diophantus. So what he did, that's a truly dutiful son. I wish I had children like that. Uh, he, he published this Diophantus with sort of these little set out things for his father's notes, which were nicely typeset and things like that. All the marginal notes, all the notes appear in this edition. So we have that. And of course, there is the most famous marginal note in this book of Diophantus is Fermat's statement that for no, uh, if uh, n is 3 or 4 or 5 and so on, you cannot have x to the n plus y to the n to be equal z to the n for positive integers. And then he continues, I have a remarkable proof of this fact, but it doesn't fit on the margins. Uh, so after that, many, many mathematicians spent their lifetimes trying to find the remarkable proof. Uh, Fifteen years ago, Andrew Wiles, a British mathematician working at Princeton, uh, came up with a remarkably unintuitive 100-page uh, proof. Uh, but now we have a proof. And nobody believes that that's, that's the proof Fermat had in mind. Uh, there is this lingering doubt, did he have a proof? He was a very, very great mathematician. So if he said he had a proof, his words had to be taken have to be taken very seriously. But on the other hand, the fact that no mathematician was able to come up with anything remotely fitting on the margin or whatever, uh, maybe he didn't. Uh, as we shall see, he made some other mistakes. And uh, again, lots of his mathematics with his marginal notes in this book and his letters to Mersenne and his friends. Again, they were writing letters. People at that time were able to write letters. So uh, one of the things which they all got excited about is trying to figure out when 2 to the n minus 1 is prime. And Greeks knew that it's true for 2, 3, 5, 7, maybe 13. Maybe 13. One could, uh, the, the historians argue then uh, uh, some German guy, Hudalicus Regius, uh, proves that it's false for 11 and proves that it's true for 13, for sure. 
Then Pietro Cataldi in Italian approves that it's true for 70 and 19, but also claims that it's true for 23, 29, 31, and 37. Uh, well, it's surely not true for 23, 29, and 37. So it's actually very, I mean, you say, isn't it trivial? I just compute. Well, try factoring numbers like that. It's actually very, very non-trivial. Okay? And we will do one factorization, but as we shall see, the factorization which was done by Fermat used fairly advanced mathematics. So Fermat was able to factor this one and this one, eliminated two candidates. And non-trivial, as we shall see, not using non-trivial, non-trivial techniques. And again, they keep writing because Mersenne got very much into perfect numbers. It was his thing. And he keeps asking everyone, what are the perfect numbers? Which could we get? And everybody starts studying. Descartes gets involved. Uh, Frenichel gets involved. Fermat gets involved. It becomes a very sort of important subject. And uh, in one of his last publications, Mersenne comes with the following conjecture. And this is, from that point on, primes of that kind are known as Mersenne primes. This is just official name for primes of the 2 to the n minus 1. He says that it is for all the numbers less or equal to 257, only the following will give you primes. 2, 3, 5, 7, the Greek ones, 13, 17, 19, then 31, 67, 127, 257. Well, the amazing fact, he, he sort of got it a little right, but not completely, not close. Uh, many people claim that he probably meant 61 here because it's not prime for 67, that he meant 61. But he misses 89 and 107. You could hope that he meant 107 here, but it's harder. Like 67, 61 indeed look close, especially in typesetting of, of the time. Uh, 107 and 127 do not. We do not know for sure 257 is not prime and there is no, no 89. But s s from that point on, these numbers are known as Mersenne primes. Uh, how many do we have? Well, we have a bunch. Do we have infinitely many? We don't know. Again, this is another important thing that the number of Mersenne primes is not known. We know that up till now, there are a certain number. Uh, there are always you know, announcements on the front page of New York Times that another internet search. Remember, there are all these internet hunts for, pri for large primes where people connect millions of computers to, to do number field sieves. Uh, it, by the way, started in this very building. The person who wrote the code for distributed number field sieve. His name is Mark Manasseh, and he used to be a researcher at Dex CERC, which they still service our elevators, if you look at the, at the thing like that. So he was the guy, occasionally comes to see me here. Uh, and uh, uh, sort of, you could become famous for finding yet another large Mersenne prime. It's, it's, a, it's a good business. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and there, there are wonderful, wonderful mathematical techniques for doing that. So, and obviously, every time you find a Mersenne prime, you find a corresponding perfect number. Because as far as we know, the only perfect numbers are the ones which correspond to Mersenne prime. So Fermat got very excited. And... Uh, in June 1640, remember I said, let's get to 1640. It wasn't just D'Artagnan, it was this letter which attracted my attention. So in one of the letters from Fermat to Mersenne, he writes the following thing. He wants to factorize 2 to the 37. 
and to factorize it, he actually needs some complicated mathematical theorems. So if n is not a prime, 2n minus 1 is not a prime. He needs to prove that. If n is a prime, blah, blah, blah. We will work through, through that. So, uh, and then he factors 2 to the 37 minus 1. It is an instructive thing. Let me just walk you step by step through his logic. Using one of his theorems, he says, well, if it divides, then p minus 1 is divisible by 37. That, and then p is 37n plus 1, and then p is odd, which means that p is 74n plus 1. So now, let us try m1. Well, 75 is not a prime. Let's try m2. 2, 149 is a prime and does not divide. m3. It's 223 is prime and does divide, he factored. So he found a sort of way of reducing, you know, because you say, well, he needed to do just, you know, 200 divisions. Well, 200 divisions is a lot for big numbers. So reducing it to a couple was a big deal. He was able to, to do things like that. For example, it took another 100 years for people to prove that uh, uh, 30, this was true. Well, it did it. I mean, it's hard. These things are hard. Fermat should be, Fermat knew enough to prove it, but he didn't sort of the theory is that he made some arithmetic mistake in the proof and sort of never, never recomputed. Re uh, now, so let us try to prove the first Fermat thing, that if 2 to the n is prime, then S n might, must be prime. It is actually fairly simple. What do we do? We assume that opposite. This is the standard mathematical technique. Let's assume that the u and v, which are greater than 1, such that u times v is equal to n. Then we know that 2 to the n minus 1 is equal 2 to the u v minus 1, yes? Which is 2 u times v minus 1. When we 2 to the uv is 2 to the u times v. That's what happens with exponents. And then we use our formula, remember, for difference of nth powers. And we say it's 2 to the u minus 1 and the descending sum of this. Now, this is greater than 1. This is greater than 1. we found a decomposition of 2n minus 1. It is not a prime. Right? Yes? Is there any geometric insight into prime or a perfect number? No. OK. This is not true. Not that I know. Which is, Prime numbers are very funny. When we study them, they behave like, not like regular geometric figures, but like, in some sense, random numbers. They're not random. We know they're not random. There is a hard mathematical way of determining what's prime, what's not prime. But their distribution looks somewhat like random thing. And, you know, they. Let, let me tell you, for example, it seems that there are for in any sequence, there are 
infinitely many primes. That there is a famous result. You, we, we started the fact by, by the theorem by Euclid that there are infinitely many primes. Right? Very early on, say, for sure, Fermat knew that, that there were infinitely many primes of the kind 4k plus 1 and 4k plus 3, which is harder. But there are infinitely many. There are no, by the way, there are no primes of the form 4k plus 2. <laughs> Just none. Uh, you know. uh, so the question arose about primes in arithmetic progression. Another way of viewing it, sort of, if you take a line, how many primes would you, you will hit? Right? And so how many, if you take a, a n plus b, right? and a, where a and b, of, of course, have to be core prime. Otherwise, you will never encounter. How many primes of that form are there? And there is an extremely complicated proof by Peter Lugène de Richelieu, a great German mathematician, in spite of his French sounding name, uh, which uses totally non trivial analytic methods, things known as L functions, which is still on the forefront of mathematical research, very, very advanced stuff, where he proves that any arithmetic progression contains infinitely many primes. Sort of now, the second question, do we have some way of generating primes? Like, could we come up with some formula which will give away only primes? No. Euler once was able to find a sort of neatly looking pol polynomial which gives prime for the first 41 values. Stops. So there are, you know, Prime seems to be everywhere present, sort of whatever, it's, you know, they, they, they're, they're sort of randomly distributed. Of course, they're not. Right? It's, it's. And the perfect numbers, do they have geometric? Uh, perfect numbers, we do not know even if there are infinitely many perfect numbers. Don't forget, that how many perfect numbers are there? as many as Mersenne primes. And we have what? I forget today's count. 42. Yeah, at least, no, no, at least as many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we don't, the only ones which we know are the ones corresponding to Mersenne primes. Every mathematician is 100% convinced that that's the only perfect numbers there are. That it's commonly, nobody will tell you, but I'll tell you. No mathematician will admit it in public. There are infinitely many Mersenne numbers. Nobody will make such a claim because, you know, it's a very, nowadays mathematicians are not supposed to say things they don't know. And I don't know it, but there are infinitely many Mersenne numbers. <laughs> but, but do I know it? No, I have no proof. But sort of there are secondary evidence, not proofs. But I mean, we still, I mean, every so often we get one. They sort of, I don't think they'll stop. But we cannot prove anything. Uh, then N is prime. So uh, now, what does Fermat do? So Fermat. There's a very interesting thing. Remember, he writes to Mersenne, there's one, two, and three. And this is interesting. We just proved that. And two and three are actually really, really very important. That's the key. And now Fermat, in another letter, writes Fermat to Frenicle. He would send the proof if he did not fear being too long. You know, I find it amazingly consistent with his marginal remark in Boucher's <laughs> book. Sort of, he never ever sent anyone any proofs. 
and he always found excuses of that nature. So, is it that he didn't know how to prove? No, I mean, from multiple remarks in his letters, all of everybody who studied Fermat, and many people did, uh, we, we know that he actually knew how to prove. He was very, very great mathematician. But somehow he would hide them. He, he would challenge you to prove. He would find all kinds of excuses. At some point, he realizes that it's not polite to say, I'm not going to show you the proof. So he, he starts doing this. I don't want to bother you. You know, it's too long. It's, you know, very, very interesting. Amazing guy. By the way, very proper magistrate. He's a lawyer, sort of always dressed in his robes. Fix absolutely, you know, you could sort of check your clock by when he arrives at court. I mean, sort of very, very methodical guy. But sort of had this peculiar feature. Uh, but what these things two and three come to one of the most remarkable theorems in all of the mathematics. It's known as Little Fermat theorem. He didn't call it Little Fermat theorem. He didn't call it anything. But this is the Little Fermat theorem. So if p is prime, a to the p minus one minus one is divisible by p for any a between zero and p. Sort of. This is known as little Fermat theorem. And this is essential, the most essential thing we are going to learn during the first journey, the most important mathematical result. And it's truly very important. OK, the proof was delayed. Again, Fermat claimed to have the proof in 1640, but he didn't have enough paper to put it or whatever, so the <laughs> usual excuse. We know for a fact that Leibniz discovered the proof because in his notebooks there is a proof. Right? Leibniz was very, very great, and I wish I could tell you about Leibniz, but sort of, he was German anyway. So uh, <laughs> maybe one day I'll tell you about Leibniz, but not, not this time. And then there is a gap. Everybody wants to prove it. By the way, it's not that people do not try. Many people try. It's one of the great outstanding problems, together with many other results by Fermat. So Fermat makes all of these conjectures, all these statements, many, many, many. And all of them are true, except one. And this is not last Fermat theory, which is true. Fermat wanted to find primes Not minus, but plus. He wanted to find them, and he made the following conjecture. That 2 to the n plus 1 is prime if and only if n is 2 to the i. That numbers 2 to the 2 to the i plus 1 are prime. They are known, by the way, anyone wants to guess? Fermat primes, right? So he says that they're always prime, OK? So let us prove at least one of it. I mean, he was partially right. That is, if 2 to the n plus 1 is prime, then n is 2 to the i. And what do we need? We actually need our old thing. Let us imagine that it has an odd factor. OK, uh, here you have to rely on a profound mathematical theorem that if a number has no odd factors, it's 2 to the n. I don't need to prove it, I hope. So, uh, so let's assume it has an odd factor. So if we use the formula which we just obtained, then 2 to the n plus 1 is 2 to the m times uh, to the power 2q plus 1, plus 1 to whatever power. The good property of 1, you could raise it to any power without changing it. Uh, so which is equal 2 to the m plus 1 and this alternating sum difference. Right? So we could factor it. 
if it's not. Right? That's factorization. This is, by the way, all these formulas, sort of sum of powers, difference of powers, they are very handy. Do not, do not forget them. So uh, Fermat states that it's prime for 3, 5, 17, 257, and all the way up to this enormous number. Well, and then he says, and so are they all. Sadly enough, uh, he was wrong. Uh, only the first five are prime. As far as we know, there are only five. People have been looking since that time to find the sixth. If you find the six, remember, rich and famous. <laughs> but nobody so far found the six Fermat prime. Sort of Euler showed that Fermat was wrong. This is amazing fact. Fermat was wrong. And he's never wrong except this conjecture. Uh, they checked as far as I know. We know now that up to 32, which is 2 to the 32, they are all uh, Composite. And this is one big number. Imagine 2 to the 2 to the 32 plus 1. It's quite a number. Do you know where these 10 and 20 digit numbers came from from Fermat? Well, he, he was able to compute powers of 2 quite effectively. So he actually wrote them. This is, okay. No, I understand. Okay, but so, so do we think that he. Um, found factors for other ones that were in between? No, 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 no. This is just the next one. Three, they go, these are, these are potential candidates. They, they just go by huge gaps. It does go, to, I mean, you know. So this is 32. See, it's this, this number, right? So he, he was checking all of them. And first five are prime. Then he somehow claims, I, we do not know, this is a mystery, why he claims that these two are prime. But he does. And then after, it takes literally almost 100 years for Euler to factor it. Right? So at that point, it's the first mistake Fermat for my mistake, which is ever, ever found. Yes? Did he say it was a theorem or a conjecture? Because sometimes he, for this one, did he think he had a book? He conjectures that they're all, he, he writes, I believe right, that they're all prime. But uh, they're not prime. Right? He, he got it. Uh, these, by the way, they look as perfectly idiotic numbers. What we shall see in the next journey that one of the most remarkable themes in geometry, which Gauss proved, depends on Fermat primes. Again, one of the important things in mathematics, you never know what will come handy. They came handy. OK, guys, I need to here come to my great compatriot, Leonard Euler. And I have to talk about Euler because there are very few people as great as that, if any. In some sense, one of the most remarkable people in history of science. Pronounced Euler, not Eula. Never say Eula. And uh, sort of there is a quote that, uh, from Laplace which says, he is the teacher of us all. And in some sense, every mathematician, everybody who knows anything about mathematics nowadays has to acknowledge sort of eternal debt of gratitude to Euler. He is one of the most sort of remarkable people who, who, who did just about anything imaginable. I was born 
in Switzerland. Switzerland at that time is a very, very important center of mathematical studies because they have a bunch of brothers called Bernoulli brothers. And these Bernoulli brothers do many great things. I, I wish I could tell you everything about Bernoulli brothers, but the most great thing they do, they teach young Euler. And then they get him a job in St. Petersburg. In 1730, this young student, 23 years old, younger than Ryan, he goes to St. Petersburg. He thinks that they, he will teach geography there. But somehow, by the time he arrives, it takes several months, great adventures. Uh, he arrives there, and lo and behold, they appoint him to do research in mathematics. So he spends uh, uh, about 10 years in St. Petersburg, goes to Berlin, because at that time everybody wants to have him. And Friedrich the second Friedrich the Great of Prussia really wants to get him to Berlin. He gets him to Berlin. And then, of course, all the courts in Europe start doing all kind of secret mission stuff. Get Euler. This is pretty amazing. I mean, the French ambassador to Berlin has his one, number one agenda, getting Euler. And so does Russian ambassador. So they all sort of come up with different sort of plans of how to do it. And eventually, sort of, Euler be becomes annoyed with Friedrich, who is a libertine sort of king, and goes back to St. Petersburg and spends the last 20 years of his life in St. Petersburg, uh, sort of going blind but still producing enormous scientific output. After he dies in 1783, it takes Imperial Russian Academy of Science 60 years to publish all the papers he submitted for publication because they, he submitted that much. So they, they were publishing and publishing and publishing. 60 years. Right? His collected works are over 80 volumes. A amazing amount of stuff. I believe, you know, Paul knows I always say that there are there's some treasures in his work which we haven't found because there's just so much. He writes books on all kinds of subjects. I mean, one the second greatest book in, in history of mathematics, the first greatest book, of course, is Euclid, is his introduction to analysis of the infant. A remarkable book. But he also writes a great book on differential uh, uh, calculus, which is way above and beyond anything you ever heard. And uh, three volumes of integral calculus, which is effectively calculus of variations, and plus whatever, eight more volumes of stuff amazing amount of work. He works on mechanics. He works on shipbuilding. He works on ballistics. He works on everything. Extremely kind and wonderful person. Any young budding mathematician everywhere in Europe writes him a letter. He would answer in courage and suggest sometimes literally giving away his proofs. Okay? So if a person clearly of a saintly disposition, so much so that a Lutheran church, I don't know my, whether my Lutheran friends know that, but Lutheran church makes him a saint and celebrates his day on May of 24th. You know, sort of, they have oil huh, as one of their saints. It's not bad. I mean, you know, I'm always tempted to, be, to become a Lutheran with Bach and Euler. It's not bad, you know, it's not bad. So, uh, so in any case, a very, very great man. And among many other things, he encounters work of Fermat. He buys this publication of Boucher's, uh, you know, remember the Sun publishes. And he goes through all the conjectures and start proving them one by one by one by one by one. Sort of by the end of the, his life, he effectively proves all but one. That's why the last one is called the last Fermat theorem. That's the one Euler couldn't quite prove. But he invents an enormous amount of stuff. He sort of is just 
you know, there is a book recently published, which you, know, you might want to take a look, short little book called Weller, the Master of Us All, which attempts to give this sort of his breadth. But it falls very short of, of, of reality. The man of, we have, to, we have to know about him. We have to venerate him, not, even if we are not Lutherans. At Lutherans in particular. So, uh, so what does he do? Let us try to see how Euler proves little Fermat theorem. First, he, he reads Euclid carefully. All of these people did. And observes the following remarkable thing. The product of two integers smaller than a prime is not divisible by prime. Like, you couldn't have that two integers are smaller than prime, but when you multiply, you get not the prime, but some multiplicative of prime. Say that 7 times 11 is going to be 3 times 19. Uh, it's not so. It cannot be so. That's what Euclid proves. And let us see how Euclid proves it, because again, we will encounter the standard Euclidean technique of sort of start with the smallest and get the contradiction. Assume the contrary. For a given A, let be the smallest integer such that this is true, such that AB is MP. Then since P is prime, yes, what we take, let us, let us just take a remainder remained, uh, uh, we divide P by B. So it's going to be B U something plus V. And since P is prime, it's not going to be, it will be a remainder, where V is a remainder less than B. Agreed? So then what we do, we just multiply both sides by A. And we get that A P here is equal A B U plus A V. And just moving it to the other side, A P minus M P U is equal A V. And now A V is equal. We we found we just found V which is less uh, which is less than b which which is which leads to contradiction this is again the standard greek inductive way find the smallest and then construct construct even smaller yes can't you prove this also just using the fundamental theorem of mathematics of arithmetic, you can. You have to wait till 1801. And it depends on that. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic was proven by Gauss in 1801. And it depends on this. So yes, it, you can. But you shouldn't. Uh, so then, using this, we come with this a remarkable lemma. This is, by the way, I'm not giving you quite oilless proof. This is sort of my slight, slight. I'm very proud of this proof, uh, assuming it's correct. Uh, so let us take the set of all remainders of P and multiply it by A, where A is any remainder. Then I claim that it's the same set of remainders. There are no two of them will be equal. Right? And the problem is that it's, it's actually very simple. If two of them are equal, I could subtract and I could get a contradiction with Euclid's with Euclid's thing. It's basically 
you take a bunch of guys, you multiply them. You have to get a, n, uh, p minus 1 different guys. Because if two guys will be the same, if they will collide, I'll take the difference. This difference will be divisible by p. And I will get the, the violation of the previous, previous lemma. So what, what we have is this, that you know, we have a permutation of remainders when we multiply by any other remainder. Well, for those of you who know abstract algebra, what we just proved is that there is a multiplicative group of remainders, 1p. Uh, and then cancellation law, which is, again, very simple. Since we take numbers from 1 to p minus 1 multiplied by a, one of them has to map into 1. Pigeonhole principle. I mean, you know, everybody has to be covered. And the guy who is covered will be the inverse element. It will be canceling a. Right? Then just very important observation that there are only the following elements are self-canceling. One cancel one times one is one, mod p or otherwise. P minus one is p square minus two p plus one, which is again one. So another way of reading it is one and minus one are self-canceling because p minus 1 is effectively minus 1. And then another little lemma. The only elements which are self-canceling mod p are 1 and minus 1. Nobody else cancels himself. And uh, basically what, for those of you who are mathematically inclined, what we're proving is that a quadratic equation over any field has two roots. That's, and yeah, indeed. How do we know it? We say, well, what does it mean? It means a squared minus 1 is equal this times this. And one of them must be 0. Because remember, we cannot have two non-zero guys, multiply them, and get something divisible by p, get 0. There are only two self-canceling elements. If you don't understand, go home and think. This is understandable. It's not immediately. It might take you a little while, but it's actually not bad. Now, uh, here I have to tell you a little story. Uh, we are at the board. You know, I'm ready to prove a famous theorem known as Wilson theorem. Uh, as many theorems in mathematics, it named after a guy who had absolutely nothing to do with it. But there is a remarkable, his name was Wilson, and he had nothing to do with it. So, but you, they never removed. So if you want fame for eternity, somehow fin convince somebody to put your name affiliated with some famous theorem. And after many centuries, people will still refer to you, you know, for no reason. They never remove the name. Many people attempted, in case of Wilson. Uh, uh, there is a famous story. The proof of Wilson theorem was, was not known for a while. Then it was proven in two lines by Lagrange. Uh, but sort of warning the first person who stated, says that this theorem is impossible to prove w w without the right notation. And Gauss, when he writes about it in his famous number theory book, which will discuss later, puts this wonderful quote, which basically says, one doesn't need the right notation. One needs the right notion. And that's often the case. When people come and say, I cannot do it in C++, it doesn't have right notation. It's the notion they usually lack. Uh, so in any case, let us see what the theme is. The theme, do I have to tell you what factorial is? Factorial is a product of all numbers from 1 to the factorial of n is a product of all numbers from 1 to the n. And what Wilson theorem says is that 
t minus 1 factorial gives you the same remainder modulo p as p minus 1. That p minus 1 factorial is equivalent to p minus 1. And the proof, well, here it's one of the cases where it's literally it's self, should be self-evident by now. You see, we write these numbers. Remember what we proved? There are two numbers which, are, which cancel themselves. The rest have different inverses. So everybody but 1 and p minus 1 will cancel out. And 1 and p minus 1, the poor orphans, because, you know, they don't cancel, will multiply. And 1 times p minus 1 is equal to p minus 1. So it's actually full proof. There will be shorter proof soon. Uh, so now let us do it, the proof of little Fermat theorem. By Wilson theorem, the product of A sub i, we just take all the remainders and multiply them by A for an arbitrary A. We know that this product is equal a to the p minus 1 and product of i from 1 to p minus 1. Otherwise, by the way, known as p minus 1 factorial. Right? And that we proved is equal to this. Therefore, this we, we, get, we get this. And then another way by we do, we, we say by permutation, permutation of remainders, we get, again, the same remainders but, but in different order. You should read it. It's actually... I could read it aloud, but you know we have enough stuff that this is actually pretty self-evident. Because basically, what what we say that if you multiply all the remainders from one to p minus one here, and then you multiply any permutation of remainders, they're equal. Why? Because of commutativity, right? So, and then on one hand, you're going to have additional factor this, and then you, 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 cancel the, the product, you cancel the product, and you get that this is equal to 1. a to the power p minus 1 times p minus 1 factorial is going to be equal p minus 1 factorial mod p. And then we cancel p minus 1 factorial on both sides. We get a to the p minus 1 is equal to 1, and we're done. You have to think, guys. This is, this is, this is not hard, but you have to, to sort of overcome your reluctance to believe me. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, it's a proof. Uh, now, simple fact, for any integer n and integer u, we call v a multiplicative inverse modul modular n if there is some q such that q times n, u times v is equal 1 plus q times n, if they cancel mod, mod n, right? For example, let me give you some wonderful example of uh, multiplicative inverse. 7 and 3 are multiplicative inverses, mod 10. They are. It depends on a profound fact that 7 times 3 is 21. Well, because, you know, 7 times 3 is 7 plus 7 plus 7, 7, 14, 21. And more 10, 21 is 1. You have to think. 
it's it's actually true so and then we have this that if p is prime a to the p minus 2 is an inverse of a and I have been waiting all my life to write that trivial you know of course the famous story usually attributed to Hilbert is like that that Hilbert lectures he writes something and then he says trivial then he says wait a second stands there for 15 minutes they say, yeah it is trivial <laughs> so uh, and the reason I put this slide is just to tell you this story so but it is of course trivial why is it trivial because you see a times p minus 2 times a is a to the p minus 1 and by little Fermat theorem it is equal to 1 so it is indeed trivial plus I told you the most important story in history of mathematics uh, now what uh, what we need is another trivial lemma that if n is composite then its factors are not invertible well this is this is this is pretty close to saying it is trivial again because let's imagine that it is invertible that u is invertible then we multiply and we get this and then sort of we rewrite and we get sort of that v is a product of n and something well n is greater than v it cannot be right so in other ways sort of this lemma tells us the following thing when, when we're talking mod n where n is not prime there are invertible elements and not invertible elements and elements which are not co-primes are not invertible let me say something which some of you will not understand but I have to say it, that if we have a ring only units in this ring units are invertible elements they constitute a group and everybody in this group is invertible non-units otherwise known as zero devices are not units there is this we will learn all of that so right now just view it as some nonsense I said it will make sense eventually so uh, for composite numbers non prime non uh, non co prime elements are non-invertible and then we could uh, trivially prove you would hear very often the case that the converse of Fermat theorem is not true everybody says that people who should know better well converse of Fermat theorem is true that is if all the elements a indeed give you remainder one more than n is prime this is just for what we just proved if there were composite elements there would be non invertible elements and if it's true everybody is invertible whatever it's trivial uh, now my concluding slide for today's lecture I promised Anil that I'll get exactly to that slide and guess what I did I'm proud of myself so I have to talk a little bit about what is useful mathematics I have to constantly struggle with since I you know the first time I started teaching which was many many years ago uh, my students would ask but why should I learn it it's not useful meaning I couldn't use it when I go shopping or whatever and the problem is that we cannot separate mathematics is not separable you cannot just have useful mathematics when I was trying to discuss this course before it started somebody suggested but why don't you just teach mathematics which is useful for a nine that I cannot do there is no a nine mathematics it just does not exist I couldn't cut a line through mathematics and say this is useful for a nine this is not useful because we do not know here right now we're encountering this classical example 
of starting with some fairly useless stuff, perfect numbers. As far as we know, and mind it, I am trying to be careful with my language, as far as we know, perfect numbers are useless. Right? Nobody ever found an application yet. Again, I have to be careful. However, work on perfect numbers led to little Fermat theorem, which happens to be one of the most useful mathematical results because it's of fundamental importance in cryptography, not just in public key cryptography. It's the foundation of sort of whole bunch of useful things. So what happens is that sometimes you have to wander in the desert. You, you really don't know whether this stuff will pan out. Right? You have to do, and how do you choose these things? Again, there is a very good sign, which, which from my point of view, tells me, it's a guiding star for me, is that if it was good for Euclid, it's good for me. If it was good for Piana, it's good for me. Well, you heard the argument. If it was good for King James, it's good for me, justifying the King James translation. Uh, but, but it's a solid argument, not, not in terms of King James Bible, but uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, sort of if it was good for Euclid, if it was good for Euler. Again, sort of trying to learn traditional mathematics is, gives me certain safety. Right? Because I'm not talking about some newfangled ideas. I'm talking about stuff which survived for many centuries. It's bound to be useful in some sense. So it's much more likely that it is. So this is also a justification of what I'm trying to do here, a historical approach. So in the next lecture, what we will do, and I hope I'll be able to finish my first journey, we'll be able to see how these results by Fermat and Euler first lead to ability of finding very large primes quickly. And then, finally, to be able, after we learn things like Euler phi function, to, to come up with uh, implementation of RSA, the first uh, public key uh, encryption scheme. And that will be the end. Just one more sentence. I, I think I have 30, 30 seconds. I am thinking that maybe after we are done with the first journey, to have a one-week break, and not only because I deserve it, which I do, but also, and even more so, because I would like everybody to do a project. I observed that I haven't been inquiring how well the homeworks are going. But I have my sources. So I think that in order to make this, at least this journey a success, we need to assure that at least everybody does a project, at least one project. And as a project, what I plan to give you is an assignment to implement RSA, both key generation and in encoding. We will learn all of the mathematics. We'll write all the central code for it in the class. But I think it would be very important that everybody tries to, to do that because it's just, you know, you didn't do homework, but you have to do the project. Of course, I know that some of you were doing homework, but according to my sources, it's not a total majority. It's less than 99%. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to report you to Diana, but, but I think that trying to do a project, and again, you have to sort of, you have to figure out whether you do it with the group, I, but doing this project would be useful. Anybody objects to this? Do you agree it might be a good idea? Okay, thank you. The class dismissed. <laughs>